Hi everyone and welcome back. I just wanted to remind everyone who is joining us that Dr. Zuckner will be doing his live presentation at two. So just know that he will be doing that. And then I just also wanted to remind everyone that we are recording this um, symposium. And so if you happen to miss an earlier session this morning, please note that you will be able to watch that on nda.org and we will probably have that up in the next couple weeks. So all of our um, previously recorded symposiums and seminars and webinars are all housed on um, a video section there. So just note that everything is being recorded. So don't feel like if you missed something, you're, you missed it, you didn't. Um, I wanted to now um, move our symposium on to discuss bracing and equipment with Abby Yenzer and Caitlin Temme. Abby has um, been a neuromuscular PT at Washington University for over two years. She graduated from the University of Evansville with a doctorate in physical therapy. She loves working in the NDA Care Center and in the neuromuscular research field. She also has a special connection to this world being as though her brother, cousin, and late uncle all have Becker muscular dystrophy. She and her family have been involved with the MDA for as long as she can remember. And I would also like to introduce Caitlin Temme. She received her undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering from St. Louis University and went on to get her master's in orthotics and prosthetics from Northwestern University. After a year of residency, she became a certified orthotist in 2020 and is currently practicing orthotics and doing her prosthetic residency for orthotists and prosthetics labs in St. Louis. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Abby. Hi, hi everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect, okay. So today I'm really focusing on um, equipment and assistive devices, basically what you can use um, to assist in and ease the tasks of everyday life. Uh, so whether that's your activities of daily living, thinking about the um, your, your daily routines, getting up in the morning, showering, dressing, um, eating, driving, etc., uh, to going to work and how we can ease that process, um, to exercising and staying active and to see if there's any equipment or any devices that we can use to make that more accessible and easy for us to do, as well as um, your physical therapy, because as I tell all of my patients it's one of the most important things you can do um, and then transfers and mobility as well you know making sure that all aspects of your life are attainable and as easy as we can make them we can go to the next okay um, so we'll start with the activities of daily living so well, you know, start from the top, you get up in the morning and you have to shower. So what sort of things can we do to make that easier? Whether it's um, from the standpoint of grip strength or balance, um, you know, can we, can you put a detachable shower head in your shower uh, so that you can sit in the shower if you've got poor balance? Um, do you have grab bars to help with your balance? You know, is is there something else that we can use, such as a loofah with a, an extender on it um, and things like that? Um, with dressing, we're looking at long-handled shoehorns, uh, Velcro and elastic laces, um, what's called a button holer. I was supposed to change that to button hook, my bad. Um, but that's this little thing in the corner down here. And you essentially, if you've got a hard time buttoning your clothes, if those fine motor skills um, aren't what they used to be, uh, if you've lost some of that dexterity, what this guy does is you can loop it through the hole on the button, like the, where the button goes, the eyelet, and it slips around the button to pull it back through the shirt, um, which can be really handy and then allows uh, for a little more independence. Um, as well, you know, Velcro and elastic shoelaces are very um, self-explanatory and how they're beneficial. It reduces the, you know, having to lean down to tie your shoes if you can slip your foot in. You've also got a shoehorn to help you with that. Um, 
because there's a lot there's a lot that goes into putting your shoes on not just the hand dexterity but you need a little bit of strength in your foot to get your foot in a shoe so if if we can make that easier get you the right type of shoes and some assistive devices to make that something you can do on your own or to be a quicker process that's that's the goal um, we also have zipper pulls so that's you it looks like if you look down in the the left hand corner again at that device that button hook also has this little hook at the end and that's a zipper pull so it just gives you a little more to hold on to to get that zipper up um, and we're going to look at eating as well you know this is something we all do every day um, if you've got weakness in your hands decreased dexterity that you've got a difficult time holding on to a spoon or a fork sometimes getting a, a utensil that's a bit bulkier, a little more to hold on to, that built up handle can be really beneficial. Um, and if that's not necessarily the case, say that still is too, hold, too hard to hold on to, if you look at the middle picture, that's what's called a universal cuff. So you can use it for your toothbrush, your hairbrush, your knife, your fork, your spoon. Um, and you can do a similar thing with writing utensils as well with the the built up utensils so if you think about some pens are very very tiny and slender and then other ones are a little bit fatter there there's a bit more to hold on to there um, and if you've got decreased dexterity having more to hold on to is going to be beneficial and make things a little bit easier um, another thing that a few other thoughts and ideas i've talk to um, patients that I work with here in St. Louis are if you've got any upper extremity weakness, so maybe a hard time getting your arm to your mouth, that having a raised tray or um, just a taller table can be beneficial. So thinking like those um, breakfast in bed trays that you could set on your table just to elevate your arm because moving in a gravity eliminated plane is gonna be easier than doing a bicep curl, essentially. Um, and the last one, which I thought is a really neat idea, someone, actually a patient with ALS and I discussed this, but if you have a hard time cutting, preparing, prepping dinner, food, and say you're cooking for your whole family, um, getting a meal kit, even if it's just once or twice a week, where all of the food's pre-cut and um, everything's ready to go, I mean, it's, it's not an assistive device and it's not equipment, but it sure can help a lot and take, take the place of those, um, those devices that you would use to make things easier. Um, and another thing that I think is really, really neat is what's called a rocker knife. Um, it's essentially half of a pizza cutter and has a handle on the top of it. So instead of sawing at your food, you can just rock in a rocking motion and just kind of cut through it. Um, so those can be really helpful as well. So this is, I actually have a, a little card for this one. This is something that I want everyone to think about if you're on right now, what, um, if you work, if you, you know, you go into the office every day or, you know, depending on what your job is, what are some things that you have done and in your specific job setting to make things easier for you or have you done anything um, to try to improve your posture. So posture is super important, whether it's sitting, standing, sleeping. Um, it allows our body to move in the correct way. Um, so if you see the, the picture here, the one with the X where they're slouched forward, that actually puts the shoulders, the wrists, and the elbows at a disadvantage. Um, so if you have a loss of dexterity or decreased strength in your hands, you're now giving yourself an even higher disadvantage by reducing, you know, the, the correct posture to this, to this slouch because now your muscles are going to have to work at a different angle that they don't like to work at. Um, and that's where you see a little bit of that carpal tunnel. When people talk about carpal tunnel, it's from working like this. And so we want you to be in a proper position with proper support so that your muscles are given every advantage to do the best that they can. Um, I spoke a little bit about the writing utensils, having something that's built up or having something with a specific grip. If you remember 
growing up, I think in grade school, we use those little grips on the pencil that help your finger position. Sometimes even that can help you hold onto the pencil a little better and make it a little easier to write. Um, and then as well as things like dragon speak or dictation devices. If you have a job where you do a lot of writing or a lot of typing, sometimes that's going to, you know, make things go a little smoother and uh, quicker without so much strain trying to write or type. Um, and one thing, I actually did not come up with this myself. It was on another um, community engagement session uh, for patients and families with CMT that someone said, you know, you've got to, and I think Vivanti touched on this a little earlier, Dr. Jones, is that stretching has to be part of your daily routine if you want the benefits from stretching. And so what this person said that they did is put a stretch board, this um, calf stretch board here, under their desk at work so that throughout the day they could stretch a little bit and keep themselves in, in, in that position while they were doing other tasks. So it wasn't something that they had to try and fit in the time later so that they could get that stretching done. Um, I just thought that was a really neat idea and wanted to share that um, with all of you guys. Okay, now on to my favorite topic is <laughs> exercise. So activity is extremely important. Um, I like to use the analogy of a tightrope. So on one side, with any neuromuscular disorder, you've got um, a degree of progression, right? That we're not going to necessarily halt or prevent with exercise. But on the other side, you have what's called disuse atrophy. So what that means is, say you sat down for two weeks and just watched Netflix like I did this past, well, it's been months now, but when you sit down and don't do anything, your muscles gradually lose their strength. Um, and it takes about two weeks to start really losing that muscle bulk. So when we aren't active at all, now we don't, now we don't only have the potential for disease progression, but now we also have this sort of self-induced disuse atrophy happening as well. So if we can keep this side working a little harder, this, you know, this self-encouraged activity, staying mobile, um, you know, we're going to have better outcomes in the long term and prevent a little more of that loss of muscle strength and range of motion. So some of the things that are helpful, um, first off, we want to focus on lower impact activities, right? So we have, um, you know, sometimes decreased ankle strength, um, de decreased range of motion, decreased sensation, which are all, all risk factors for injury. So we don't, we don't want to be putting ourselves at a higher risk for injury with exercise. We want to be improving our strength and, and mobility with exercise. So making sure we're doing things safely is, is, is a huge part of that. Um, so some ideas as far as equipment that can help. So for one, if you don't have um, good grip, grip strength, um, you can use ankle and wrist weights or cuff weights to do your exercises. You don't have to use weights to do your exercises. General active range of motion, if done, so low weight, high repetition. So if done again and again and again, can be just as challenging as, um, as a lower repetition with a higher weight. So you don't, by no means do you need weights to be active or to exercise. But if that is something you're interested in, um, that, that cuff weight can be helpful. The other thing is, is dumbbells. So if you can grip and it's something you want to use, that's fine. I would recommend not going extremely heavy. Again, we're looking at, at lower impact, um, lower weight and higher repetitions being more beneficial. Um, you can also get what's like a cuff for a strength machine. So if you've ever heard of adaptive gyms, um, they, you know, in some cities they have, these adaptive gyms and what they offer are ways for, for people with disabilities um, 
to be able to be active and participate in a gym environment with the right equipment. So they, instead of having a grab bar for a row, it has wrist cuffs so that you can pull it back without using your hands, um, which I think is very, very cool. The other quick um, equipment here that you can use, a recumbent bike is a great way to get your cardio in without putting more stress on your ankles and knees or putting you at a risk for falls. Um, I do like the idea of going for walks though. That's what I meant by trail there, like just taking a nice walk. But the important thing there is again, safety. So if you use braces or you use an assistive device, a walker or a cane, that's something you're gonna wanna have with you um, when you do go for a walk. And I usually highly recommend going with a buddy as well. Um, swimming is, another one of those great exercises. Um, and if you have access to a pool, that's, that's the equipment part there. If you have access to a pool, um, I would highly recommend taking advantage of that. Um, and then this little pedal bike here in the bottom, that can be used for your arms or your legs and you can put it anywhere in your house and just get some cardio in. I think the um, center for health and, and I don't remember exactly what it is off the top of my head. Um, they recommend 150 minutes of exercise a week, which is about 30 minutes a day. Um, and that's for everyone, you know, that's what's, that's what's helpful for all parts of your body. So your lungs, and I'll talk a little bit about this later in the exercise section, but that's, what's going to Get, keep your bones healthy, keep your muscles strong and mobile. You know, we want to keep that range of motion, prevent contractures, etc. So getting in those, that cardiovascular strength, that, you know, that just that activity every day is so important. And these are the, you know, the types of equipment and exercises um, that we can utilize to really make that happen. Okay, next slide. Okay. Um, and then therapy tools. So I know a good majority of patients with um, neuromuscular diseases have had therapy in the past um, and will continue to have therapy into the future. And so these are some, some tools that you can use uh, not only for general strengthening, but also for dexterity improvement as well. Um, so therapy, which is essentially like Play-Doh, just gives you something to pinch and pull at, um, twist, use your wrist, your forearm, etc. cetera. Um, the rubber bands, the resistant bands, um, like just like a normal rubber band, you can put in your hand and expand, um, pinch and pull. There's all sorts of different exercises you can do with those. And these don't have to be therapy specific devices. These are things that you can find at Walmart or Target or Amazon, you know, these clothespins can just be clothespins and just practicing pinching them with your different fingers can help maintain that strength. Um, the stretch board, like I showed earlier for ankles and calves, I think if you can get one of those that, that really does take a lot of the stress and time management of adding that particular stretch into your daily routine because a you don't necessarily have to be standing to stretch so it's a little bit safer if you have decreased balance um, and you can put it anywhere you can do it at work you can do it while you're eating dinner um, so just it really makes that a little bit easier and then wrists and hand splints so we know that you know it's not just our feet that have deformities and um, muscle imbalances and CMT hands as well. So this is a great way to to stretch and to maintain some of that you know the integrity in that hand um, if you if you have pain and if you're starting to get some some tightness and contractures. Um, these these last two slides are you know not not everyone's going to need this sort of equipment, but I wanted to touch on it in case you do need it or in case, you know, down the road, it may be something that's beneficial to you. This is what I call planting the seed. So you've heard about this stuff before, you know what it looks like. Um, so the, the easiest one here to use is the slide board. So if you say you're by yourself and, and you can transfer, but it's, it's not pretty, it's not safe and you just need, you know, something there 
to help that process go a little smoother. The slide board goes under one side of your hip um, on the chair you're in, usually your wheelchair to the surface that you're trying to get to, whether that's the couch, uh, your bed, the toilet, et cetera. And it just allows you to be on a surface to slide across. Um, We've got the Hoyer lift here, which is a completely dependent lift. So it sort of, it has a sling that's sort of like a hammock um, and it can be used to lift the patient from, from a wheelchair, from bed to, to the next location, wherever they're going. Um, same thing with the sit to stand, but what the sit to stand does is it allows for weight bearing, it allows the patient to uh, be up on their feet for a little bit. So that, that can be really beneficial and really therapeutic. Um, especially if you know you've recently had a surgery and you're only allowed a certain amount of weight bearing or you just want to start to try to weight bear again that that can be a, a good way to transfer and to reintroduce that um, and then the pivot pivot disc you know so if you can weight bear and you can stand but you can't quite take steps and you've got um, a, a caregiver, a family member who is who is comfortable with transferring you, this just spins. So you, you stand up on it and then the person you're with will help get you from point A to point B without you having to take steps. And then lastly, I think are the um, mobility devices. So we all know that as, as you lose that nerve function and your muscles start to get weaker because they're not getting the feedback. Um, it, it gets harder to walk. And so you've got braces, but a lot of times there's so much more um, energy output that if you wanted to go to say the zoo or the mall, that that's gonna, it's gonna take a bit more out of you. And so that scooter and the rollator, I think are our first line of defense to um, to get you going further and have a way to rest uh, while you're out and about and that way you can fully participate in whatever you're doing whether it's going to you know a family member's house um, or to church or to the store that way you can still be involved in those activities but not have it be the only thing you can do that day that you can still um, have some of that energy uh, you can also use assistive devices like walking sticks and canes um, and a, a traditional walker. Um, the one thing I like to really encourage people to understand though is that um, a walking stick and a cane aren't necessarily going to prevent falls once they've started. So if you've started to trip or fall, a cane's not going to necessarily prevent that, but the idea is that it improves your balance so that we reduce the risk of falls. Um, and then the last one on here is, is that power chair. You can also have a manual chair, but depending on your upper extremity strength, um, sometimes a power chair can be more beneficial if, if that's the stage you're at and that's something that you need. And it really does just make, um, make it easier for you to get around, easier for you to be more involved in, in your life and help you reserve your energy for the things that you truly want to do. Okay, and that is it for me. Um, if you guys have questions, we'll wait till the end and I will be happy to answer them then. Thanks, Abby. So, hi everyone, my name is Caitlin and I'm gonna be covering the bracing part of our discussion today. So, I'm gonna start off with why I believe bracing is so important with the, for those with CMT. First, bracing is going to discourage deformity progression as CMT progresses. This works alongside that good stretching regimen Abby was just talking about. So although it's not always possible to prevent deformity, we really want to delay or decrease the, that rate of progression. Second, the brace is going to support areas of weakness. For example, if you are just starting to have difficulty with picking up your toes, of course it's possible you could compensate, bend more at the hip and knee when you're trying to swing it, swing that leg through um, and get by without a brace, but you're probably not going to be able to walk for as far or for as long. A brace is going to help pick up those toes, um, decrease fatigue levels, and allow you the energy back to do your day-to-day -day activities easier. Uh, additionally, by picking up those toes, we're going to decrease that risk of falling. 
Next, bracing can restore foot alignment, which promotes a more efficient gait pattern, helps with balance, proprioception, and decreases gait compensations. Um, and by limiting those gait compensations, we can decrease excessive pressures placed on our hips, our knees, our back, um, and just overall help with joint pain. Uh, so when thinking about what level of bracing is most appropriate for you, it's important to realize that no two patients are the same with CMT. Um, that just because you have the same type of CMT as someone else doesn't mean that the same type of brace is appropriate. Each person is different in their stage of progression, rate of progression, what that patient wants out of their brace. Um, so each person is going to present very differently from one another, and each person has to be individually assessed by a certified orthotist to make sure that their bracing is at the appropriate level for them. Some factors that may affect brace choice include how much strength has been lost. Are we able to correct your foot to a neutral position, or have we started losing some of that range of motion? Has, have we lost some stability at our ankles at all? Um, has our sensation started to decrease where we can't really tell where our ankle and foot are, are in space or in relation to each other. My goal as an orthotist is to brace the least amount as possible. Um, we want to give just enough support to compensate for any weaknesses, but at the same time, I want to allow you to use your own muscles to decrease rate of atrophy. So ideally, I would start bracing someone as soon as they start showing symptoms with something as simple as a custom foot orthotic, which is shown in the center of the slide. By using custom foot orthotics um, compared to just an off-the-shelf insert, that means we're able to get total contact with the bottom of your foot, which is especially important for those with high arches. Um, as can be seen on the left hand side of the slide, as the arches begin to rise, the surface area of our foot meeting the ground gets smaller and smaller. So that means that the forces that our body weight is bearing through with each step, um, that surface area is getting smaller so the forces are getting higher. By using a custom foot orthotic, we're able to get total contact with the bottom of your foot so it's able to disperse all of those forces and um, over every step taken, and it helps discourage painful calluses or any skin breakdown from occurring. And if anything has already started to occur, we're able to kind of offload those areas of irritation. Uh, another benefit of custom foot orthotics is that a wedge can be placed under your heel. So you can see that in the top right hand side of the slide. Um, by wedging your heel to the correct alignment, it's going to discourage rolling your ankles, um, help with ankle pain, and decrease the risk of you getting a rigid deformity in your heel. In some cases, when sim symptoms start to develop, a child is too young for foot orthotics. Um, for example, a child who is having delayed walking around one or two years of age, these children would, would most likely be best suited with an SMO style brace, which is in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, these provide all the same benefits as mentioned above, but they have the added ankle stability since they come up a little bit higher um, right above the ankle bones. Um, so, Usually, however, when I start to see someone with CMT, it's when their symptoms have started to progress to a point where it's, it's affecting their daily activities. Um, and that's different for each person. So at that point, what brace is best for them will depend on how their CMT has progressed and what's most important for them. If you are mainly dealing with ankle stability issues. So rolling your ankles a lot, you're getting a lot of pressure on the outside borders of your feet. Um, and a foot orthotic j just isn't working for you anymore. I would lean towards one of the braces on the left hand side of the screen. So that being an SMO or a short articulating AFO, mostly depending on age. If you are having your primary complaint is of catching your toes and fatigue, then I would lean towards a carbon fiber AFO, which is the black brace in the center top of the screen. 
Um, these are great for a couple of reasons for someone with CMT. First, they are lightweight. They're extremely lightweight. So that is going to help with our fatigue levels. Second, they are super flexible. So when we are wearing the brace, it's not going to lock your ankle up. It's gonna allow motion in both bringing our toes up and down, which allows a more natural and smooth gait. Third, even though it's lightweight and flexible, it's still really strong since it's made out of that carbon fiber. So it's gonna provide enough strength to keep those toes up as we're trying to clear our foot when you're swinging that leg through. Fourth, it doesn't do all the work for you. Because of the design and flexibility, it requires the user to fire their own muscles as they're walking to discourage rate of muscle atrophy, which is something Abby just talked about. So we don't want a brace to be doing all of the work for you, or we're gonna start to see that, um, that atrophy because we're not, we're not using it as much. Um, on top of that, if you're having excessive pressures or callusing or mild ankle instability, you can actually place a custom foot orthotic on top of this AFO. Um, because it's so thin, it should be able to still slip into most shoes. Next, if you're starting to have tightness in your ankles, losing a bit of range, I would lean towards an AFO that will assist in lifting your toes, but is not gonna allow you to point those toes down past 90 degrees. So this is shown in the top right. Um, so it's gonna allow you to use whatever ankle motion you have left, but it's, it's going to try to discourage progression into that tighter heel cords and con contracture. And then finally, I would lean towards a solid ankle AFO for those who um, have an ankle that cannot be corrected back to a neutral position or that have had a surgical fusion. So if we're just not able to get you back to neutral, you're just going to, you'll need more support um, than something that's super flexible to be able to control you to allow that more efficient gait pattern. Um, and that, that's in the bottom right hand corner. And there are some people who could benefit from bracing that does come up higher than just below the knee. Um, this is usually, usually in later stages of progression, um, and it's not as common to have to do this, but some patients do. And again, every patient is different. So what you or your family is comfortable with plays an important role in the decision-making process as well. So I could make you this great brace that I think you walk in great, looks beautiful on you, does everything that meets my goals, but if you don't like it and you don't wanna wear it, there was no point in me making it for you. So your input is very important in the decision-making process. Okay, so there are some modifications that can be made to braces uh, for ease of getting the brace on and off, especially for those who are um, struggling with upper extremity weakness. Uh, so the most common way is by adjusting the straps. The easiest way to do that is to just minimize the amount of straps on the brace. So we're decreasing the amount of Velcro that you have to fight to get the brace on and off. So um, something I would just ask your orthotist if it's possible to decrease the amount of straps that are on your brace. It's not always possible, but sometimes it is. Second is actually to melt the hook on the end of the Velcro strap. And this is what's shown in the pictures to the side. So in the top photo, you can kind of see on the top strap, there's um, kind of a smoother surface. So what we actually did is we melt the hook part of the Velcro. And so when you put the two pieces of Velcro together, the hook and the loop, like the rough and the soft pieces, that area is not going to stick, which is shown in the bottom photo. So that just gives you a tab to grab onto, um, get a, a better grasp on compared to fighting a Velcro strap that is completely stuck together. Um, and this is something you should be able to ask your orthotist to do. It's pretty uh, simple and quick. 
And then there is another thing that isn't, is a little bit more difficult, but it's just not really as aesthetically pleasing is you could add a ring onto the end of the Velcro strap. So um, instead of having to actually grasp onto that Velcro to get it undone, you could just stick your finger through the loop and pull to get the Velcro undone. Um, this is a little bit more difficult on an orthotist's end to do, so you may have to ask them to do it before the brace is done, um, but it's definitely a good option as well. And then finally, what shoes work best with a brace? So an athletic style shoe is going to be the most accommodating to orthoses and bracing. Uh, I personally like New Balance best. They come uh, in, enough, in enough depth and they come in wide and extra wide, uh, which is usually needed when we're adding that bulk of a brace. They come in a variety of sizes and colors and they don't look super orthopedic. Um, some, some brace shoes are just like white or black and they just, most people don't, don't wanna wear them and I understand why. So, um, and New Balance comes in both kids and adults. So they do work for most people. Um, another recommendation are the new Billy shoes. So these were, these are the ones on all three on the bottom of this slide are Billy shoes. So they were specifically designed to be worn with braces. It has that, that zipper you can see on the side it comes all the way down around the front of the shoe and it actually folds open. So you don't, once you set the, the laces, you don't ever have to touch them. And once you unzip it, it actually flaps open and then the brace can just come up and straight down into the shoe. Um, these make getting a brace on and getting the, once you have your brace on into a shoe, um, a lot easier, especially for those with hand weakness. So these come in toddlers up to men's, women's. They have low top, high top, a lot of different color options, a lot of different style options. Um, the one on the, the right is a men's dress leather shoe. So um, I can't say these will work with every single type of AFO as they don't come in the same width options, um, but they are a great option to try. And I have had a lot of patients who have had success with these and swear by them and love them. So um, if neither of those options work for you, my recommendation is to just go into a store whenever that's possible. Um, again, and just try on shoes with these general guidelines. So you wanna look for an athletic style shoe that has a square toe box. So if the toe box is like pointed and not square, when you put your brace on, it's not gonna be able to go all the way in and then you're gonna to have to size up um, in a couple sizes, which just adds to bulk and increases our risk of falling. So um, a square toe box is better and it usually will allow for more space in case you need to, um, to use like something like a toe spacer. Um, laces are easier than Velcro, but I understand not everyone can use laces. So if you're going to do Velcro, look for ones that have a longer strap. So then that way, when your brace is in the shoe, you're not having to worry about that strap. You're not worried about getting that strap long enough to get it over um, so that, it, the, that the shoe closes and can keep your brace on. Um, then you, when looking at the shoe, you wanna look at the tongue. So you wanna make sure that the tongue will actually open up from the shoe. A lot of times now that tongue is either sewn in or has like elastic banding to keep it down, which will actually prevent that shoe from opening up for you to get that brace, to get the brace into the shoe easier. So either look for it without it, or you might have to snip that elastic on the sides of the tongue. Um, and then finally, just always take the insole out that comes in the shoe to give you more, to give more space for that brace to fit in there. Um, and then if you find a pair of shoes that you love, you can get the brace on, but you yourself just have difficulty getting the shoe on and off with that brace, then I would take it to a shoe repair shop and I would ask them to add a zipper down the counter 
of the shoe. So like in the back area, you can add, add them to ask a zipper. That way you're not having to fight to get that past that 90 degrees, which is usually the hardest part about getting that brace on. Um, so you can just put that zipper down and you just go straight into the shoe and then zip it back up. And then you don't even have to worry about if it's Velcro or laces on the front of it. So kind of going back a, a different way of doing the billy shoe, basically. It's just on the back side now. Um, and you can, if they're adding that zipper on, add them to add like a nice tab on there as well if you're having upper extremity weakness and you have a hard time with tabs. Um, it'll just be something a little easier to grab onto. These are, are my references. We'll see if we have any questions. All right, thank you, Caitlin and Abby for that. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. And so I do want to um, go through a few here. We had someone ask that they really do like the Blue Rocker Brace by Allard, but they want something that's a little bit more sturdy and not the color blue, but the color black. Do you have anything that you could recommend? I have personally never seen that exact brace, so um, I can't say like if there's one similar in design. Um, I would assume it's a carbon fiber brace. I personally like the um, the Autobach walk-on. That's the one that I use a lot of the time because the strut comes up the back, but it actually runs onto the inside, so it's not hitting the ankle. Um, so that's our typical go-to. Okay. Um, another question on bracing. It makes sense that you would have increased energy with ease of movement, but will bracing progress the disease faster due to less use of the area? Less use of the area. So that's why um, we don't want, that's why we don't want to over brace. So if we're we don't want to, if something as simple as like a carbon fiber AFO will work for you, I don't want to stick you in that big bulky solid, an solid ankle AFO because it is going to do all the work for you. And then yes, you are going to start to get that muscle atrophy. So I want to keep bracing as small and minimal as possible. So it's still challenging you working those muscles. Um, we're not getting that, that atrophy, that muscle atrophy. Okay. This person is saying, I'm a 39-year-old with CMT1A and have ankle weakness and soreness, but my foot drop is not yet substantial. Should I start considering braces? And if so, where do I start? It's a really good question. Um, I would say something as simple as uh, foot orthotic would probably work for you right now. It's hard to say without actually seeing you and assessing you. Um, but I would just go online and type in like orthotics or orthotic and prosthetic near me and find out where an orthotist is close to you and go in. Just getting um, an assessment by someone doesn't cost anything. So um, they can assess you and tell you whether you are a candidate or not. Okay. This, we got a really interesting question here. Um, and Abby, I think this might kind of be towards, towards your expertise. How do you get the therapist to understand that CMT is lifelong and prevent from continued getting discharged from their services? It's conflicting, you know, when the treatment plan recommends therapy and you go to therapy and then you have that short-term goal and then sent home. Um, do you have any advice for that? Yes and no. Um, so a lot of it is education. Um, so if you are, uh, if you, if you attend, um, I guess an MDA care center where you have a physical therapist, um, sort of like I am at St. Louis, um, at Washington university, uh, that PT is going to be a great resource for you. Um, I think on the last slide of Caitlin's presentation, my email is in there. Um, if you want to reach out, I, you know, I, I assumed it as part of my role as I'm a PT at an MDA care center that I would, you know, I reach out to the PT, you know, cause not all outpatient PTs know much about neuromuscular diseases. Um, I, sometimes I look back and I laugh. I'm pretty sure the only thing we were taught was, um, that neuromuscular diseases exist and that they're progressive. And so it's, you know, it's not really well 
covered. Um, and as far as just lifelong conditions in general, it, it is really hard to get them covered um, continually. And you can, it can be done, um, but your PT really has to look into, you know, what billing and, and what documentation they have to put in there for it to, for insurance to cover it. You know, you really have to dig for the right, um, you know, the right words to put in there. The other thing you can do is, um, you know, it, it's wording your goals correctly as well. So maybe strengthening and range of motion aren't going to change for you. So those should not be your goals if we want to progress. So maybe it's balance or maybe it's um, improving how you perform a task at home. You know, focus on those goals rather than strictly strengthening and range of motion so that we can continue to show improvement. Um, and uh, lastly, now I've lost my train of thought. Um, oh, um, maybe having, you know, most, most physicians are good about writing PT, PT orders. So making, you know, instead of going for two months in a row, um, maybe have that discussion with your PT to do it once every month or once every other month and really just maintaining that home exercise program. So this is where it becomes homework for you. You've got to stick with it. Um, but that, that way you're still following up with that PT uh, from time to time to make sure you're, you're going in the right direction still. Okay. Um, someone messaged in, um, or do you do a different brace on each leg? Is that good or bad? Uh, you can do a different brace on each leg. So it kind of just depends on how you're presenting. Um, we don't want them to interact with each other. So, but it's, we definitely have patients who have like an SMO on one side and then a tall AFO on the other. So, um, if we're wanting to minimize brace or, um, if you're really struggling with one side more than the other, um, that might be, that might be something we go to. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. This person um, has said this is that their AFO after surgery is a solid ankle AFO and it does have some flexibility, but the company that made it um, made a mistake and cut down the middle of the front. So they were able to put it on. However, the cutting is um, actually cutting the circulation off and causing swelling of the leg and foot. Do you have a recommendation on fixing that issue? Um, I don't think I'm understanding about the cutting down the front part. Okay. Uh, so I can't, I can't really picture what you're saying. Um, if you wanted to send me a picture, you can, uh, that would probably be easier. But I would say if a company provided you a brace, if it was somewhat like within the last couple of months, especially, and if you're having issues, go back into them. It's, it's their responsibility to make sure that that brace is fitting well. It's not causing you any issues. It, it should not cost you anything. That's part of, um, what we do. It kind of depends on how long it's been, but, um, they should be making sure that that fits right. So I would just call and schedule a follow-up appointment with them. Don't keep letting the swelling and stuff get worse. That's great. That's great. This person was recently recommended to get a, um, is it CAFO? K-A-F-O? Yes. Uh, uh, for hyperextended yeah. knee issue and foot drop. Can you bri briefly explain the brace that would be needed for that? Um, so, uh, CAFO is a brace that usually comes all the way up, um, to, it comes up to almost the hip, like the top thigh area. Um, so the, there's a, as you saw on the AFOs, I didn't even list all the different types of AFOs. Um, there's many, many different designs of KAFOs as well. So um, that really just means that it's coming proximal to the knee. Um, if we're trying to prevent hyperextension of the knee and because an AFO itself isn't controlling it anymore, um, I would assume that it's something that's going to kind of block you um, in kind of a neutral knee position and not let you kind of force that knee back and um, stretch out that knee capsule anymore. Uh, the 
AFO section to keep those toes up will probably be something similar to what you saw on one of my screens though. Okay. So it'll just be similar to one of those braces, but have an extension that comes up higher. Okay. And we're at the top of the hour. I just wanted to ask, um, we have one more here. Is the TurboMed external brace a good option for CNT? Are you familiar with that brace? I am not. I think that might be the one that's listed on the CMT website. That's like an external one that connects to the shoe. Okay. Um, if that is what that is, I have personally never used it. Do I think that it could, it could work for the right person? Um, yes, but I, I don't, it's not going to work for every person as well. It kind of depends on if you're having instability in multiple planes. Um, that one specifically just addresses issues um, like toe drop issues in a forward to backward plane. It's not necessarily affecting balance or side to side at all. Okay. And our final question that I'll end with, since we are at the top of the hour, um, if you have a job where you're on the computer and it requires you to type a lot with your hands excessively throughout the day, could this actually have a negative impact on CMT? I think that this, you know, it's going to go along the lines of any type of overuse, whether you have CMT or not. Um, I don't think it's going to affect the progression from, from a nerve standpoint. Really here we're looking at, at balancing um, fatigue in the muscles and just recognizing that without that complete input from all of the nerves and all of them being healthy, that some of our muscles are going to have to work harder than, than they would if, if you didn't have CMT. Um, I'm not sure if that, that's extremely helpful, but you know, just making sure that you are in a good, in a good posture, in a good position for that typing so that we're not doing any excessive um, work that doesn't need to be done and, and stretching and recognizing the fatigue you know, and just taking breaks as needed. All right. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much, Abby and Caitlin. We are at the end of your segment. So I do appreciate your time. And I know um, we are going to have Abby join us in our next session. Um, we are going to start at 110. And then just to remind everybody, we are recording all these segments. And our final segment for the day will be Dr. Zuckner on genetics. So we hope that you can stay tuned until um, 3 p.m. Central Time. So we will resume at 1.10. And thank you, everyone, for joining. <laughs>